most men choose to settle for a small story, a small life, a life that they feel like they can control, they can arrange for. The truth of the kingdom of God is it requires risk. And the invitation of the kingdom of God is to mature in wholeheartedness, mature in union, so that we can be entrusted with more and more, and God can be glad to partner with us in bringing his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. He's preparing us, he's making us ready. All of this is preparation. It matters much, but even more so in the world to come, he's readying us to be kings and to rule, to bring his heart as he intended it to be. It's just so different than settling for happy little life. There's a fascinating story in the Gospel of Matthew regarding a Roman military captain. It goes like this. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed and is in terrible suffering. Jesus said, I will go and I will heal him. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me telling this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished and said to those following him, I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. For years, I wondered what Jesus was after in this story. What is it that astonished the heart of God? In the Greek original language, the word is thalmetsau, and it means to be amazed and marveled with a supernatural wonder. And of all the places that word, thalmetsau, is used in scripture, this is the only place that it's used in describing a person and the condition of the faith within the man. What is it that astonishes the heart of God? For years I wondered about this and finally sat with one elder that has been leading me on this ancient path. And he helped me understand the centurion soldier was a man who came to understand the spiritual and soulful reality of how to live in authority and under authority. Just pause with me and think about most of the men in your life. Whatever else you observe, how is it that you see them living in relation to authority? Often it's men that are in authority, but they're not under it. And other times it's men under authority and not in it. But largely, when it's all said and done, mostly we as men live rather self-sufficiently and independently. When we turn to the Gospels and we see the life of Jesus, we see an entirely different, disruptive and enticing model. We see strength through dependency. Jesus lived in utter union with his Father. As he says in the Gospel, I do nothing apart from my Father. When you see me, you have seen the Father. It's out of union with the Father. It's strength through dependency and from this union from the wellspring of union, a man in authority and under authority. Jesus models for us and makes available to us what it looks like to live in wholehearted masculinity. Toward the end of the Gospel of John, we're led in on a secret in the life of Jesus. We see him on his very last night with his closest friends do what culturally would be the unthinkable. And we're led in with this prelude where it says Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. And it was from that place that he chose to serve those that were intended to serve him. He washed the dirty, 
weary, broken feet of his disciples. He led with the heart of a servant and he served with the heart of a king. You see, in Jesus' life, he understood and lived out of the reality of being a man in authority and under authority. Jesus drew his strength from Thout Mitzau, from the strength, the supernatural life of being a man in authority and under authority. It's been said by sages and elders of the faith that much spiritual maturity in a man can be measured by how quickly and deeply he responds to the leading of God in his life. Our capacity to rule and enforce God's kingdom in our kingdom never exceeds our willingness to consent to God's authority in our life. We were made for dependency, strength through union, moment by moment intimacy with a God who is the initiator and we the responder. We were meant to cultivate this intimacy as the context for our maturing, that in time and over time, more of us would be given over to more of God. And friends, nothing more is required of you than that which you can do in union with God. G.K. Chesterton knew this. In the 20th century, there was an essay contest hosted by the London Times, and the question was, what's wrong with the world? And Chesterton offered this as his full response. Dear sirs, I am sincerely yours, G.K. Chesterton. Chesterton chose to take responsibility for the man who he'd become in his false self, and he chose to put to death through a process over time, the false man, and through the life of Christ, through the resurrection power at work in his initiation to become more and more of the true man, to ascend to the process of becoming a king. Through recovering the ancient path, in time and over time, we can become the kind of men, the kind of kings in whom God can gladly entrust the care of his kingdom. And the hope is this, that in time, the inverse would be true of the London Times, that when the question is asked, what's right with the world? Through our actions and by the mark of our courage and our love and our strength, our vulnerability and our union with God, our lives will say to the world, I am. I lost a good friend to cancer years back. He was one of my very first sages and mentors as this message was being recovered. He was a man who in the later decades of his life gave himself fully to be apprenticed and to participate in the process of becoming a king. He knew he was a man under construction in need of restoration because of cancer and knowing that his days in this world were numbered. He had the privilege and the rare opportunity to make his own grave marker. And there on the grave marker, he wrote John Milton Moorhead, end of construction. Thank you for your patience. John knew and lived out the words of C.S. Lewis, where he says that heaven is the consummation of our earthly apprenticeship. God believes in you as a son, as a student and as a man. And that's why he's entrusted so much to your care. Every generation loses the gospel and every generation is charged with its recovery. The gospel is always preserved on the edges of cultures, on the fringes when the story of history is told. Desire does reveal design and design reveals destiny. The world is deeply in need of a few men in this generation that would say yes, that would consent to the process of recovering the ancient path, of becoming the kind of men, the kind of kings in whom God is glad to entrust the care of his kingdom in ever increasing measure. I want to be among them and I want that for you as well. For now, well done. The best things in life take time, and slow and steady does win the race. And so my question for you is, would you give a decade to consenting to the process of becoming 
a king. God honors you with the dignity of choice. If you will give your heart to this process, I can assure you in a decade's time that your places of greatest sorrow and greatest shame will be places in which you are bringing a true and genuine strength to others. When I pause, I see the faces of many men who have fought bravely and risked heroically to say yes in the midst of circumstances that they did not choose and outcomes they did not wish for. They were men who said, yes, I want the life that God offers. And I very much look forward to connecting with you, my brother, perhaps in this world and surely in the one to come at the great campfires of the kingdom. And there we will stand shoulder to shoulder with the heroes of our faith and we will raise a glass to the King of all kings, and then we will know, then we will see fully what we now only see dimly. For today, I borrow my strength from the words of George MacDonald when he says, does God then not know what a man is going to become as surely as he sees the oak which he put there lying in the heart of the acorn? The most important thing about a man is not what he does, it is who he becomes. Who will you become?